Hi everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and we're excited to have another entry in our EHR telehealth series. We're here with Azalea Health, and we're here with the co-founder and CEO of Azalea Health. His name is Baha Zaydan. Welcome, Baha. Thank you, John, for having me. Yeah, so I, I love this series because we get to dive deep into a product, which, you know, maybe we should do more of at Healthcare ID today. But, uh, you know, before we get into all the details of how you're approaching telehealth, tell us a little bit about yourself and Azalea Health. Yeah, so I'm a technologist uh, at heart, computer science degree, but started at the company after seeing that the, the healthcare industry is needing a lot of help when it comes to digital transformation to the cloud. Azalea Health basically developing an EHR platform for the provider side and the hospital side. And uh, we've been integrating telehealth for a while. So glad to be with you and look forward to dive into that topic a little bit more. Great. So tell us, what was your view of telehealth and really Azalea's view of telehealth pre-COVID-19? And then, you know, how did COVID-19 change that approach? Yeah, so uh, Azalea launched our telehealth solution in 2016. So we're, we were way ahead of the game when it comes to integrating telehealth within our application. And actually started within a hackathon within the employees of the company, oh, the developers. So we, we spent very little on our telehealth solution. It was a, uh, an internal hackathon in 2015, which we launched in 2016. And the view that we took on telehealth is fairly simple. We wanted a solution that enables the provider to see the patient face-to-face -face and over telehealth and in a remote setting. And we felt that the future of healthcare requires the provider to do both, where, you know, just look at what we're seeing now at Home Depot, for example. You, you can go to the store, you could do an online pickup, you could go online delivery. And we felt back before COVID, uh, that that is needed uh, and not knowing that there will be something called COVID-19 <laughs> uh, but we saw that technology is, is needs to, and the provider need to provide uh, a solution in both of those settings and uh, so we started this hackathon we implemented it uh, within the solution and of course we had um, uh, daily usage of telehealth but it's minimal and of course, when COVID-19 hit, we just turn it on. It's a flip of a switch. Turn it on on all of our clients, enable them to leverage it uh, immediately. Since we're a cloud solution, is they didn't have to install anything, and um, and enabled our clients to just run with it and uh, utilize it. So of course, while you have a mass uh, adoption like that, we found a few things that we need to tweak, but the foundation was there. So. Um, that's that's our uh, telehealth, the before and after. Yeah, it was amazing how much it fell upon deaf ears and how those deaf ears uh, started to perk up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember, uh, you know, going to, to telehealth conferences early on and it's just few vendors there, few panelists and over time seeing adoption, uh, but still not to the level of COVID-19. And, and, you know, in a way that is the silver line that comes out COVID-19. Yeah, no, the telehealth conferences were, were vendor fest, which is kind of interesting how uh, you know, it'll, that's changed. <laughs> not a user fest, it's vendor fest, you're right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was interesting that you, you came out of a hackathon, an internal hackathon, which you know I, I love those. I think those are great for developers and allows for their creative mindset and inspiring them. Why did you choose to develop it in-house? Uh, you know, it was that part of the hackathon or because I mean, and I guess, you know, back in 2016, there weren't that many great outsourced telehealth solutions. So was that part of the thinking as well? Yeah, it's part of the thinking. So like you mentioned, there, there were not a, a whole lot of plethora of vendors that developed a telehealth solution. WebRTC was available. There were, uh, you know, tool, open set of APIs for our developers who were able to leverage right out, out of the box. But we felt that a telehealth solution uh, is an integral part of the EHR. And the EHR's job is to simulate and simplify the physician workflow. And if we wanted a telehealth solution, it needs to be an integral part of that workflow versus, excuse me, a, a point solution. 
or uh, an integrated solution that's just on the periphery. We're not against integrating with other telehealth solutions. And uh, however, we felt it needs to be part of the patient portal, part of the scheduling, the virtual waiting rooms versus the actual rooms, as well as the clinical documentation and the billing. And weaving it through all of those steps in the EHR is difficult to do through a third party vendor versus if we do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are some of the integrations that you did? I, th I think it's also integrations with the EHR, but also the PM system, scheduling, right. et cetera. So, you know, how, you know, what's available now integration-wise, and are, you, are you, there still some things that you're working on integrating in the future? Sure. So what we have now, it's fully integrated within the patient portal in both web and mobile apps. Uh, and both platforms, Android and iOS, as well as integrated within the provider scheduler, the provider clinical documentation. So as the provider documenting uh, uh, their SOAP note and the clinical information, they can be seeing the patient on a corner and minimizing that. But also the provider can be a primary care and consulting with another specialist within that setting. And, and, and actually we allow not only uh, the patient and multiple providers to be seeing each other and collaborating, but we allow, allow multiple providers to be collaborating on the SOAP note itself. Mm. Uh, and what we do, what we allow all after that is allow that visit to go to the billing. So if the billers want to review that uh, note, but also play the video if it's, if it's recorded and, and be able to listen in for either uh, billing uh, points and, and, and information around the revenue cycle. Uh, uh, they can do that. And also from a billing workflow, we started also leveraging reporting and analytics to understand the utilization aspect of it and the completion of those visits so that they can be at the end an audit trail of, of those telehealth visits, they didn't go to waste. They ended up uh, moving to revenue. Interesting. You know, I, I, in this series that we're doing, I haven't talked about recorded video. So it's interesting that you bring it up. Maybe I should have added it. But are, are you seeing a lot of your providers recording the video? Or it, it sounds like it's a, a user configurable it's, feature that they can choose to record it. It's an optional. Uh, and we felt that we want to give the option to the provider and the patient to choose, hey, you know, like you just said, uh, yeah. record this interview. So, you know, it's an optional. <laughs> I do need to check to see the utilization of the recording versus the non-recorded uh, sessions. It's a great question. I'll, I'll have to check on that. No worries. I, I can see a whole future article and, and seeing it, who all is offering this across the spectrum. It's a great follow-up to the series. Uh, you, I mean, it, it is interesting because recording is valuable to the patient to be able to see. It's valuable to the biller to see what was really done. But it's also a double-edged sword because then you're also liable. So that it's it's such an interesting debate, uh, which is yeah, really that's a the healthcare for, for you. It's, we always overcomplicate it on our own selves. <laughs> it, yeah, it's true. I mean, it depends. Are you talking to the medical person? Or are you talking to the liability uh, risk management guy? So, <laughs> that's oh, the old age sword. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So let's do uh, my favorite part of these, which is the feature lightning round. So I'm going to offer a feature, and you're going to let us know. You know, do you have it? Do you not have it? Are you working on it, etc. You know, so give us an idea of how or how are you approaching it if it's something a little more complex. So first up, are you is your telehealth solution HIPAA compliant? Absolutely. Yeah. No surprise there. How about custom branding? How are you uh, dealing with custom branding? What do you offer? Yeah, there? we allow custom branding on both sides. So uh, we allow custom branding for the patient portal and allowing the clinician to custom brand that. But we have some of our uh, partners, um, they leverage our revenue cycle management for their billing companies or their entities. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we have some customers who are using it for their telehealth solution if they're providing telehealth as a service. So we allow them to co-brand our application in that side, the EHR application as well. Nice. So you can even white label the full EHR. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Co-branded. Yeah, we, we makes sense. Co yeah, yeah. Very, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. And um, how about uh, telehealth appointment scheduling? I assume it's integrated with your PM? Absolutely. And the provider can simply, within their schedule, they can surface up any open 
openings in their schedule and they can choose to kind of allocate telehealth or non-telehealth visits uh, to that. So it makes it a lot simpler for the provider and, and the patient. Interesting. So they could block off like a section of time. Okay, here's my telehealth time so that they're not going in office telehealth and back and forth. That's correct. Yes. Okay. And does that, I assume that helps. Uh, and do you do uh, uh, patient self scheduling of appointments? Absolutely. Yes. We allow the self scheduling. Uh, of course, the, the office has to approve it or the physician staff has to approve it uh, at the end of the day. But yes, we allow the, provi- the patient, I'm sorry, to self register and self uh, schedule their appointments got you so it's almost more like a request and then it's approved and they get it you know, makes sense cool and uh, how about asynchronous text messaging with the patient so it's um, messaging but not text messaging so we do have secure messaging on the app and uh, and the patient uh, through through messaging uh, solution within our application but it's not text messaging yeah. Okay. We look forward to. We're actually having a text messaging as a future strategy to 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 take advantage further in the text messaging within the application. So that would be part of it. Awesome. Yeah, and I think OCR's come out with some pretty good guidance that text messaging is allowed if you've gotten approval from the yeah. patient. So you know, I think it's opened up that opportunity in a in a good way because uh, I think many were afraid of that for a long time. How about a real-time text chat during the visit? So, you know, asynchronous might be a reminder, it might be a communication. But during the visit, you know, some of the telehealth solutions have the real-time text, maybe even, you know, file sharing, et cetera. So we do have file sharing. We don't have a real-time text uh, because we, we, we envision that there's, a, at that point, a face-to-face interview, per se, or... Uh, um, uh, or a call actually we allow also calls to be recorded and initiated from the platform the same way as a web RTC session uh, so we, we will look in to see if the customers and the patients see a need for that to, to integrate that uh, it won't be a difficult solu- uh, way to, to address it but uh, right now it's not available Gotcha. Yeah, what we see some people doing this is uh, is really if you want to share, share like a link to patient information or, or things like that, that's where we see it sometimes used. Uh, it's it's not a, yeah, anyway, there's a mix of people who've adopted it or not. Uh, it'll be sure. interesting, like you said, will it become a standard? I don't know. But uh, this is where we're kind of understanding what people have done so far. Uh, how about, you know, you kind of talked about this, but let's dive in web-based versus app-based. And then also, you know, it can come from the clinician perspective and the patient. So maybe start with the clinician. It sounds like you have a web-based and a app for them. Yeah, yeah. we're both web-based and app-based for both patient-facing and provider-facing. And and just to understand that a little better, you said that uh, they can do the telemedicine through the portal. Do they have to log into the portal, or how does what's the workflow for a patient? To connect. So uh, it would be best experience if the patient logged in through the portal. Um, that way they, they, they can see the full picture of their clinical data and clinical information, past appointments, uh, current medications, and so forth. But we also allow the physicians to generate like a link or almost like a go to meeting feature right. where you can allow somebody to log in and hop into a session without logging in and just giving them a, a session ID. Uh, we have some actually using it that way. Our preference is to go through the, a full logged in solution, that, uh, the login path. Sure. Yeah, there is some interesting privacy questions if they haven't logged in, but there's also some usability questions if, uh, yeah, so if, <laughs> if they have the to log in. To check that box for meaningful use as well. Yeah, yeah that's true as far as uh, usage of the portal. That's a good point. How about audit logs? Uh, I assume it's similar yeah. to the EHR. Yeah, it's very much so. I mean, our audit log is very intense uh, as far as, as uh, you know, who viewed, logged in, linked the session and so forth. You know, it's, it's fully integrated within the application and it's part of our DNA. We audit log everything that the, the, yeah. the patient and the provider does. Well, okay. the fact you have a video, uh, that, that, that's the uh, audit log on steroids, potentially, yeah. <laughs> if they want it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. All right. Uh, how about automated patient reminders? Oh, absolutely. That's a key. I mean, we automated patient reminders is is a, a key to engagement. We look at 
telehealth as part of a broader patient engagement strategy and uh, of course texting a reminder and 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 email reminders uh, is a key to that strategy so it's already in, uh, available for the providers and patients to use yeah it's been interesting going through this series because every hr vendor has said they have automated patient reminders and yet we still see a, a thriving industry of patient reminder companies so uh, you know it's interesting that i think there's a lot of nuance to that that maybe is not captured in this it, you know, it, it, we're, uh, I mean, still uh, the health IT industry is, is an, you know, from a maturity perspective, is still early. So there's a lot to be done. Yeah. No, I, I, I guess I'm, uh, I guess I see that uh, not all reminders are created equally, it feels Absolutely. like. <laughs> so I think you have to dive in there, you know, anyone that's evaluating your solution. Uh, how about the patient intake paperwork and being able to fill that out electronically? Yeah, and it, that's actually part of the patient portal as well. So they do that, and, and we give the provider the flexibility to, to do whatever they want to do as far as forms and collecting information. So it's a very simple tool that allows them to, to, to generate all sorts of intake information. And we have also a library of already built out uh, intake forms that we can share with them, uh, but they can do their own as well. And since it's on the portal, I assume that's digital signature for HIPAA privacy notice, et cetera, as well. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And how about uh, the uh, virtual waiting room? Or, you know, I kind of broad that, group that broadly into what's the workflow? Can the MA get there and then the doctor? Or does the front desk get, you know, how are you looking at workflow uh, in that kind no, of virtual waiting room? We simulated the uh, actual physician office virtual into a virtual environment. So actually when the physician log in, they, they see kind of the workflow of their own office. How many appointments in the day, who's in the waiting room, who's in room A, B, C, D, who's at the checkout. Hmm. And actually part of that, who's in the telehealth room. And they'll see how many patients in that telehealth room and how many minutes they've been waiting there. Then Because again, we the way we think about the telehealth solution, it has to be a part of that workflow and part of the delivery of, of our providers and uh, we want them to see just like the the patient who's in room a and how long uh, they've been waiting there they should see how, uh, also the telehealth patient so it's part of that workflow yeah i think that throws off the number though if they show up early and <laughs> there's so many nuances to wait times right but it definitely sounds like you have a more sophisticated uh, approach than some of the others that you know, the, the waiting room is a single waiting room for that person, and it sounds sure. like you put some thought in there. Yeah, we've, we've been at it for a lot longer, even though the adoption, uh, as we discussed earlier, is, is, is uh, you know, ha has flared during COVID-19, but Azalea launched its uh, telehealth solution in 2016. Right. No, that explains why it's more mature. Uh, many of them, I think, are playing catch up in that regard. Uh, how about multilingual, and I guess it's kind of related, but a little separate, uh, remote interpretation as well, being able to bring in an interpreter. Yeah, they can, actually. Part of the, the, the solution that they can invite anybody, so it, it doesn't have to be a, a linguist or a, a translator per se. They can be the, the son of that patient or the father of that patient. It could be another provider. It could be a group of providers. So we allow that flexibility to have multiple people join in that session and in real time uh, be able to, to talk and speak and, and, and if need to do to translate as well. And is your portal and everything, is it multilingual? Is, you know, or is yeah, we adhere to the standards uh, as far as uh, the ability for a uh, browser to translate that information, um, mm -hmm. but that's how we, we uh, tackle that. That's a good point. The browsers have gotten better at the uh, multilingual translation for him as well no need to reinvent the wheel for that well, yeah it's not perfect yet and so you already kind of addressed team-based sessions it sounds like that's a, that you can yeah, bring absolutely. teams together and everything uh, how about integrated clinical documentation yeah that's part of the core uh, uh, value proposition of our telehealth is we, we want the physician to be able to see the patient face to face and document the clinical encounter there and as well as over telehealth and um, again we, we see that telehealth uh, is is a key to 
uh, continue to capture those patients from leaking to other telehealth companies and um, uh, and integrating it within that workflow is the key. So yeah, it's fully integrated within the clinical side. Have you integrated any sort of like uh, ambient clinical voice, you know, NLP technology to like automate the documentation process? Yeah, we, we're actually, you know, one of the key initiatives this year uh, for us to kind of figure out where in the application we need to integrate AI and uh, leverage uh, uh, AI from different vendors uh, that provide clinical AI and actually this is in the works currently we're figuring out what areas in the documentation and and the reason also we're recording the video we're seeing uh, that in the future we could plug in apps that can analyze the video and, and be able to generate additional uh, either uh, supporting information for billing or supporting information for clinical uh, uh, warnings. So um, uh, we're in the process to, con or continuation of, of in looking into how can we make our application smarter and how can we make uh, computing and AI uh, help our providers do uh, less computing and work and typing and, and, and more patient uh, facing. Yeah, to me, I, I see telehealth as the opportunity to really explode that because it's already on camera. It's already being recorded. We have microphones. We have video cameras. Like, you know, th that's the explosion that could happen. <laughs> provider burnout is is real thing. I mean, you you, you, you know, you probably uh, uh, had oh, so many discussions around <laughs> provider burnout. And, uh, you know, any way we can make our solution simpler, to use, simpler to implement, simpler to interact with, is just make it stickier and, and, and make our value proposition better. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, once it's on telehealth, uh, that would actually be a compelling reason to keep doing telehealth if it was, you know, auto documentation, as I call it, right? Uh, yeah, that would cause them to do it, but it also would be a compelling reason, oh, why do I need these microphones in the exam room well yeah. if they start seeing it in telehealth they're going to be like no you have to put it in my exam room well you know uh, i know you, we're still in the lighting round but one of the points uh that uh, our team were looking into um, nationally uh, during the early uh, april late march the industry lost about 30, 60 percent patient volume uh yeah. due to closures and we said, hey, let's look at our customers and let's look across all of our customers and see what was the dip look like. And believe it or not, the dip looked just the exact same. It's almost like a Nike uh, sign where it's a severe dip and then kind of gradual growth back. However, we had actually 30% less of a dip. So the industry was a all the way to 60 percent and now down to 10 we're actually the the, the lowest of the tip was at 30 percent and we're now hovering closer to to eight or so percent below or actually getting closer to to, to uh, pre-covid 19 numbers and the reason behind that is is the physicians were able to jump into adapting telehealth pretty quickly and the second reason is, is uh, you know, a lot of our customers are in rural America and the impact in the rural side was less wow. than urban side. So uh, we, won't, we won't give telehealth all the credit, but, uh, yeah. it, but it did have a, a major credit for that. No, wow, that's some great numbers. Thanks for sharing that. So let's finish a few more features. Uh, so how about screen image capture? So if I hold up my wound, can you capture the image? I, I think so. Yes, we do. We, there's ways yeah. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course you can do a screenshot, but you know, there's hip issues there. <laughs> How about screen sharing? Are you able to say you want to pull up some patient education or maybe their lab results over time or something like that? Can you do screen sharing? I believe that's in the work. Um, not a hundred percent sure that we have the screen sharing feature live yet. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's not a, a common one yet, but it will be interesting to see, you know, is that, going to be required so uh, right. how about patient education I assume it's similar to your EHR the same stuff 
Yeah, absolutely. It's part of the patient portal and uh, they can, uh, we have libraries of patient education that's tied into the diagnosis, but also we allow the physician to share patient education uh, directly to, with the patient um, and make that process simpler for them. Yep. How about the, uh, and you know, this is kind of two or three features at once, so a lot of companies take it different ways, but like the post-visit patient rating, reviews, surveys, uh, how do you approach that? Yeah, so we have a way for the physicians to do that. Actually, we, we allow them to create forms with input where they can have star ratings and so forth. But we'd like to take it to that next level uh, at some point through a partner or, or ourselves. But the capability is available now that through them being able to take a form and, and make it uh, where it takes back feedback from the visit with rating. Yeah, I think we've seen that, especially on the reviews, a partner is uh, is often a better solution because there's so many review sites uh, and it's very regional. <laughs> Correct, and, and, and there's a lot of companies that they can take those reviews and share them and Yelp and, and Google, exactly. and, and, and they yep. take reviews to that next level. So, however, if, the, if our provider wants to know their review just for their own self, that's yeah. available. They can simply right. put, create a one to five or a, a simple form of to, to, to request that, and, and when that review is completed, they'll come back into the EHR. But we see that there's a, need, a, de a deeper need for um, reviews through a partner and, yep. and we'll be working through that. Yeah, and especially as they try to get back to those visit volumes, uh, th those reviews are gonna get really interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to be done in the healthcare and one of the things that we're focusing on as, at, as AD Health is, is uh, providing our API and making sure that our API is not only public but also rich to enable the, the developers and the provider to take advantage of that. We, 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 we have tremendous amount of data, tremendous amount of uh, uh, workflow information that we want other vendors to tap into and, and create those new widgets. I, I see even in the future that there could be a telehealth solution just for dermatology where it could do AI on the image, the size, and, and, and create a lot of uh, uh, what I would call depth to that visit outside of just the normal, you know, a video chat. And we want to enable those uh, opportunities for other vendors and, and our clients to take advantage of it. So let's talk about that since you went there. You know, how are you approaching third party, say, telehealth solutions? Obviously, you have your own telehealth solution, but what is your approach if, say, one of your customers is like, I'd rather work with Teladoc or Amwell or whoever it might be? Yeah, so our approach is is to uh, uh, is the same approach to any third party f uh, vendor and any third party uh, application is to have a modern infrastructure with a very rich endpoint API and enable the provider to take advantage of that. And the way we actually did it is it's, it's a open set of API based on Smart on Fire. And actually, it's part of our health information exchange. So we developed our health information exchange to be based on uh, Smart um, uh, Fire uh, and and API. And we want to be able to one day see all sorts of vendors be able to tap into the health information exchange and leverage it not only for telehealth visits but for many more. Uh, ideas and, and, and conditions that we could never as a vendor be able to have the bandwidth to develop all of that. Uh, but we want to be that platform that empowers the providers and the solution and uh, developers to, to make that possible. Yep. And I think that's a good vision. Uh, I've always said you're not doing genomics, so uh, you, you're you going to need some APIs to do stuff like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you think about it, uh, there are some amazing applications, for example, that tackle diabetes as a, as a population in so uh, much um, in depth that a vendor like us can never take our application to do so much in diabetes because then right. you know what about all of the other conditions in, in the world uh, so we rather have a, 
open set of APIs, an architecture that is a cloud, you know, in, in delivery that's easy to tap into, and then allow innovation. And we feel that that is the way to disrupt uh, uh, the 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 legacy mindset in the healthcare industry. Yeah, I think it's a good one. I, I've always called the EHR the database of healthcare, so uh, I think that's the approach. So uh, one last feature uh, really is around billing. So how do you approach patient payment and then also insurance billing? Do you have specific telehealth stuff, or, or I, I imagine it's built into your existing billing as well? It, it is built in into the existing solution, but also we have uh, uh, for revenue cycle management companies and our revenue cycle management service, we have specific features to enable them to you know, audit trail and make sure those visits are built for and captured and easier for them to go m make the right modifier, make the right changes into the telehealth visit. So we, we kept the revenue cycle management in mind as we developing the application and we continue to enhance it. Gotcha. What what are, are there any other specific areas you see that you know supporting services make sense for you where you're, you're like yeah I think we'll use a partner for that you know we talked about the reviews as an example are there other areas that you know you think you're going to rely on partners rather than build out yourself? Yeah, I mean we 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 see a lot of areas that can you know if if um, uh, for example uh, you know I, I was mentioning like you know if you want to take a telehealth approach that uh, with a solution that has multiple devices and connects with mm -hmm. with different um, uh, uh, clinical devices we would want to partner with that. We don't want to be, again, we, we want to be the, like you mentioned, the database or the core platform and enable other people to build and bolt on all types of applications on top of our platform. Um, and that way we're not, you know, we're not disappointing our clients and saying, oh, well, you got to wait until our roadmap. We, it sounds <laughs> like it, we may get to it by 2025. <laughs> so we, on the contrary, we want to enable that innovation through, the API. So that's how we're thinking about it. Great. Well, just to wrap up, uh, wh what do you see as like the role of telehealth going forward for, you know, really the business of Azalea Health? Do you see it, you know, yeah. and, and let me corrupt it a little. Do you see it as a profit center for you? Do you see it, a, you know, and how do you think adoption is going to go maybe for your, your customers, you know, down the road? Sure. So we got a very fairly within our customer base, uh, north of 30% adoption right now. So we, we, we're going to see more and more adoption. Uh, so uh, we're going to see that, again, telehealth is going to continue to be part of care delivery. Not It's not going to be either face-to-face -face or, or, or telehealth. It needs to be both. And we look at telehealth as a long-term strategy for us for growth as well. So uh, we integrating our telehealth, uh, we, it's integrated already in the ambulatory and the hospital side, but we continue to enhance that. And we're seeing now as we're talking to new prospects where we can launch their imagination of how they re can reimagine their business and look at their business. Ah, well, I can start now providing this as a line of service within my practice or within my urgent care or within my ED versus just stay the traditional way. So we also winning new business because of those features, regardless if they're gonna use them now or later on. Uh, but we also see it where if, you know, uh, our uh, mission is to, to, to help the underserved providers improve patient care and profitability. And telehealth fits bullseye in both of those needs. You know, it will help patient care because you are increasing engagement and in return it's going to help the profitability of the provider because they are one they're engaging more with their patient and actually leveraging that patient for additional revenue and using that patient instead of leaking that patient to a telehealth company that really not going to care for that patient as much as their own provider does and they're not going to have that continuity of knowledge and care of the past uh, versus uh, uh, their current provider. So we see it as a huge growth engine for us and a, a, and a major feature of our application. It's interesting what you uh, said there because I think that some of the genesis for me and the motivation of doing this EHR telehealth series is exactly what you just described that I think as organizations decide their future EHR vendor 
uh, how an EHR approach telehealth is going to be a major factor in, in how they choose who they want to go forward with, not just because telehealth is going to be important to them, but also how an EHR vendor responds to this telehealth situation, to COVID-19, uh, says a lot about the company. So thank you so much, uh, Baha, for sh you know taking the time to share your guys' vision and, and perspectives. And, uh, and I want to uh, thank all of the providers in the country. They, they are at the forefront of saving our lives. And I want to thank you for bringing a great topic to the forefront of our industry. So appreciate yeah. it. Thanks so much, Baha. Thanks, everyone, for watching. If you want to find more great videos like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Baha. Thanks.